draw your attention to the fact that George Bush, the second George Bush, 43, visiting an Arab country, I think it was Iraq. I'm pretty sure it was Iraq. Either toward the end of his presidency, the magic shoe is the name of this episode. I'm going to illustrate it with a story of George Bush in Iraq giving a speech when he looks up across the audience and sees a shoe coming toward him. And the shoe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it approaches his face and he ducks. Imagine you're flying in an airplane and the shoe is beside the plane traveling forward at the same speed as your airplane and you're watching it from your window. In this illustration, the shoe is moving at the same speed. From your perspective, it appears to be motionless relative to the plane, relative to your view out the window. But from George Bush's point of view, that thing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and he realizes it's gonna hit me in the face and he ducks. Um, now suppose you're flying in an airplane going the opposite direction and you're drinking, you're drinking your coffee and you glance out the window and you see something streak by at a hundred miles an hour and you say, oh my God, get on, get on, get on the radio, get on the radio, call control tower, control tower. Uh, we have an unidentified flying object up here besides us. We're supposed to be in this airspace, and there's something up here with us. Over. Uh, I'm trying to make fun of Einstein with my story of the magic shoe. Einstein says that that shoe looks different depending on your point of view. Well, of course it does, is my response. Of course it does. Duh. And then Einstein goes on to say, if we assume the speed of light is constant, and instead of the shoe, we're looking at a beam of light or a particle of light, we know that light travels exactly at a certain speed and never goes faster, never goes slower. Therefore, from all these perspectives that I've just described, George Bush's face, your view of one airplane, another view from another airplane going in the opposite direction. Since that shoe always moves at the same speed, a constant speed, then to allow for Einstein's cockamamie model, mental exercise, you have to assume that the universe is growing and expanding and time is slowing down and speeding up. I don't have to assume that. But according to Einstein's law of re relativity, physicists must take this law of relativity into account when using GPS satellites to find out, I wonder how far it is to, Har is there a Hardy's restaurant? Let's, let's see what the GPS system says. If you hit the buttons on the dashboard of the car, and uh, the, there's four satellites above you, high where you so high you can't see them, but they're up there. And there's every every few moments in time they they broadcast uh, uh, their position. They broadcast their position every every so many moments in time. Probably I would just get say roughly I would imagine it's like couple of times a second, three or four times a second. Maybe it's 10 times a second. Maybe it depends on what kind of GPS system you've got, <clears throat> what kind of receiver. These four satellites overhead are broadcasting their position. 
I say even if they broadcast their position once every two seconds. Within a matter of seconds, six or eight seconds, you could determine with a computer program in your GPS receiver, you could determine your speed and the direction of your speed and your location and then determine how far away is the nearest Hardy's restaurant according to the map that just popped up on my GPS system according to its software and its pre-programmed maps. Hardy's is up ahead on the right and about three or four tenths of a mile. I did not have to take Einstein's time dilution into account, nor did the scientist that built the GPS system. The reason they don't have to take it into account is because it is so incredibly minute. So incredibly minute. Why is it so incredibly minute? Because Einstein's time dilution would only apply when traveling at the speed of light. The fastest spacecraft we have moves less than 10 miles per second, probably about 5 miles per second. Whereas light moves 186,000 miles per second. Time dilution is just too trivial for us to mess with. Unless we need a clock to be accurate for 100 years without losing a second. If this clock is moving at a rapid speed, such as a space capsule, we're going to travel across the solar system and beyond the solar system and beyond the solar system for a hundred years and we need accurate time uh, here on the earth looking for Hardy's we just don't need such accuracy this dilution is so trivial so trivial so incredibly trivial. Yes, it can be dismissed. It can be discounted, discarded, ignored. Yes, it can. Even with the GPS satellite system. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Because it's only dealing with nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. Look up what a nanosecond is. It's a billionth of a second. And nobody needs that much accuracy to find the Hardys. Now, if you're an atomic submarine under the ocean, you're going to launch a ballistic missile at Russia, which is thousands of miles away, and you want to know your exact position at a certain time. You want more accuracy, but still, you don't need to mess with time dilution. You're not moving that fast. Your rocket's not going to move that fast. It's all BS. And what I'm trying to tell you is the world is composed of groupies that are programmed what to think, including your physics teachers, including the people that write multiple articles in so-called science magazines and science blogs and give science lectures. I say all these are groupies, brain-dead numbskulls who bought into a false notion and they propagate it like parrots. It amazes me.